Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Um, today I thought I'd take the opportunity to discuss why I believe that Cold War era bayonets are severely underrated for what they are. Now before I get into the uh, the meat and guts of the video, um, I apologise if it's a bit rambly, a bit uh, incoherent. I'm coming off the end of a pretty nasty stomach bug and uh, a little bit uh, faint and dizzy, but I really want to make a video and maintain my one per week. I'm dedicated, so you got to give me that. Now, I prepared seven general points, and if you disagree with them or if you feel there's any that I've missed out, please comment below. I'd love to hear from you and um, let us know what you think. Now, the first point I have, and really reflects the four that I have presented in front of me, uh, they're still incredibly affordable. So the Cold War was exactly that. It was a Cold War. It never went hot. So they never saw use, and because they never saw use, a lot of people are less interested than the stuff from World War I, World War II, sort of the Victorian era. Stuff that's very iconic, you see in photographs, you see in movies, you see in propaganda, and has a bit of a history to it. Maybe something's been passed down through the family even. So, the four here I've got, uh, well, the four I've got before me, like we'll jump into this one here, the VZ-58. Uh, these are absolutely gorgeous little bayonets, made for the Czechs, 1958. And um, you can pick these up in Europe for like 20 euros. And in the States for a similar price. Down here in Australia, like you buy from Cleaver Firearms for like 70 bucks. So a little bit more down here. But if you're looking at sticking your toe into bayonet collecting, this is just a great place to start. And some other examples of really affordable bayonets, like um, you've got your US M5A ones. And I won't limit that to the US because there's a lot of variations of these, like the the Danish M62, the, the Korean versions of these as well. And even though they never saw like proper use, they were developed for the Korean War. I think they were released just after or just towards the end of it, so they didn't really see any action. Um, still a bayonet made for the M1 Garand. And they've got the M3 fighting knife style of blade. Very, very cool little blade. There's a lot of different variations, and I think they're well worth collecting. I think they're really, really cool. And then you've also got your um, AK bayonets as well. There's a lot of different variations of these. And quite a few of them are really, really affordable. Like these um, Yugoslavian M70s, you can pick these up for very, very little. And like the Romanian ones, even less. I've seen Romanian ones going for like 20 bucks. Not here in Australia, obviously, but uh, <laughs> everything costs 10 times that here in Australia. And the first bayonet I ever got was a Swiss SCG 57. And these are gorgeous blades, absolutely beautiful. And I paid 50 bucks for this. That was a little while ago, but for what you get, 50 bucks is not much. When you compare something comparable that was actually you know, used in a war, well, not used in a war, the Swiss were never in a war, but um, let's compare that to a Swiss Model 1918, a little bit older, wouldn't handle, and you're looking at four times the price. So for someone who's just um, sticking their toe in and uh, maybe they don't have a big budget or for whatever reason, they don't want to commit a lot of uh, capital into collecting bayonets. They just want something to chuck in the mantle, maybe. Your Cold War bayonets are an absolutely fantastic option. The second point I've prepared is that um, they're relatively easy to find. So while the World War One, World War Two, and particularly the Victorian era stuff, and a lot of the modern stuff too, can be quite difficult to find specific bayonets, the Cold War, uh, Cold War era stuff is pretty available and easy to find. And... I know I've changed up the four bayonets I have here. It's probably more relevant to the previous four because even though they were four of the cheapest, they're also four of the most prevalent and easier to find. But these are another four that aren't too difficult to find. Like you got the Set Miel, which is sort of pushing the boundary on what you'd consider to be a Cold War bayonet because they're sort of late, like late 80s. Um, we've got our uh, FN49, which is also sort of pushing the envelope because that's right at the start of the Cold War when you're looking at bayonets, which are really more reminiscent of World War II with a um, blued blade and a wooden handle and a leather frog. Uh, but then, like all your AK bayonets, very easy to find. And um, even the more like odd stuff, like your FN Fell bayonets, aren't too difficult to find. So you won't have to look terribly hard to find them uh, compared to other areas of um, bayonet collecting. Now, another point to cover off, and this is one that a lot of newer collectors won't really take account of initially, is a lot of the older bayonets, like particularly the Victorian era stuff, can be quite difficult to maintain. Like, it's a constant war against um, rot on leather. 
uh, corrosion on blades, making sure that they're preserved correctly because if you make a mistake and don't check it for a year and they're damaged due to corrosion or whatever, you can't fix that. And that's there forever. And there is a limited number of those and they're, they're dwindling in supply. Whether you're Cold War era bayonets, they're all, due to advancement in technology, they're all pretty resistant to that kind of thing. Like, um, we'll look at the Canadian C7 here. We've got plastic handles and stainless steel blade. And then we've got a plastic uh, scabbard and canvas frog there, or nylon frog. Those materials aren't going to degrade anytime soon. This requires pretty much no maintenance or care. You can just chuck this in a box and this is going to be fine forever. Similarly, you've got like your Yugoslavian M56. These have the thickest, heaviest blues on them of any blade I've ever come across and plastic handles. So ugh, that's not going to degrade anytime soon. And then you also get like your um, AK bayonets with your Bakelite scabbards, Bakelite handle, pop open, and your stainless steel blades. The only things that are going to degrade on these are maybe your, um, your cross guards, your pommels, and your leather straps. Although it is worth noting that the majority of these that you find don't have the leather frogs, being this piece here, and the leather straps. Oop. Yeah, this side for the handles. So this one doesn't have it. But just a lot of different um, advancements in technology that we use to really preserve the blades, like the um, Finnish M62 here has a very heavy parkerization on the blade. So while these are very, very rare to come across to begin with, I've yet to see one in bad condition. And because of this, you can really take these out field and give them a bit of a bashing and not feel too bad about it because while they're not uh, terribly rare yet, it's still very, very common. If you do destroy one, you're not gonna feel too guilty about it. You're not destroying, you know, one of 50 remaining bayonets from a particular Victorian army or what have you. Like um, M7's extremely durable. This one has seen a lot of use. It's got a chipped blade. I don't care, I'd happily take this field today, throw it around, get a feel for it, and it sort of gives you an appreciation for what the soldiers wielding them uh, would have thought of them and would have felt. And AK bayonets, same thing. Uh, and then your, your bayonets like your semis that no one really cares about. This one's uh, still factory new and hasn't been sharpened, but you get an idea that you don't feel terribly guilty about taking these kinds of bayonets out, using them practically, maybe wrecking them, whatever. Another massive benefit to Cold War bayonets is generally the time of sword bayonets by this stage is over. From memory, the last sword bayonet was uh, Venezuela, the Belgian model 1924 in like 1949, 1950 or something, I can't really remember off the top of my head. So generally all you come across are really compact little uh, knife bayonets. So for this reason, if you're collecting Cold War bayonets, you can just chuck them in the shoebox under your bed if you don't want to display them anywhere. They're not taking up a lot of space, not taking up a lot of storage. You don't need big special boxes. Um, postage is going to be relatively inexpensive because they're only smaller items. Well, here in Australia anyway, I don't know how postage works internationally and overseas. And um, yeah, storing and maintaining them, it's just easier. You don't have to worry about the logistics of uh, organizing bigger boxes or anything like that. Another point that I feel is commonly overlooked with Cold War bayonets is just the beautiful range of colours that they come in. Like, um, looking at these Bulgarian uh, AKM bayonets, just the, the Bakelite, the mottled colour to it, the oranges and reds, they're just absolutely gorgeous. This one doesn't do the majority of them justice. I've seen much, much prettier than this. This one's pretty average. If anything, it looks more Russian, although it is Bulgarian. But... They just come in a whole range of different colors compared to what you think. Like um, you also get uh, European bayonets with this wood grain Durafol scabbard, absolutely gorgeous. You don't see those anywhere else. And these beautiful bright canvas frogs, although you will find those on older and newer bayonets. Uh, I've got our Australian uh, camo M10 scabbard here on the M7, even though the bayonet's not Australian. So, I find a lot of the Cold War bayonets are a lot more visually striking and just very, very pretty. I love the colors to them. Uh, here's my all-time favorite, my Portuguese AR-10, best bayonet in my collection by miles. And it's just got a beautiful color to the wood, not to mention the bright green scabbard as well. 
So I know that's something you wouldn't usually think of when you're you know, looking at collecting bayonets, but um, aesthetically, I just find Cold War bayonets some of the prettiest out there. And my final point would just have to be how many different like sub variations there are to different types of bayonets. So these are all like the second pattern of AKM uh, bayonet. And this is three of maybe, you know, 10. There's, there's that many different kinds. They're all very different for different countries. And it's not just the AKM bayonets like this as well. You've got your um, USM 5A1s, your uh, M7s, not so much the M6s, uh, your G3 bayonets. There's just so many of these bayonets out there where there's just such a variety. Like even your um, FN bayonets, you've got your Fal A, Fal D, Fal C, and then you've got your SLR L1A2 bayonets as well. So these are the only Fal bayonets I have with me today, but um, there's just so many different variations. Like your Fal A's, there's like four or five different versions of this. Uh, your Fal B's are pretty much the same. I don't think there's too many of those. Your Fal C's being the sockets, there's a whole range of different ones of those if you're interested. And those are incredibly cheap. And then your... Um, uh, L1 bayonets, you've got the British L1A1, the Australian L1A2, uh, the British L1A3 and L1A4, and then you've got the Canadian C1 as well. So just so many different variations of bayonets you can get. And as I said, all the different G3s as well. And here's a whole bunch of different variations of uh, the US M7 bayonet as well. So we've got the Canadian C7, the US M7 in Australian scabbard. And then we've got like the... Um, Italian BM58, which is technically not a variation of the um, M7, but come on, it, it's pretty much identical. So back when I first started collecting, I was really into the uh, World War One, World War Two stuff, and then gradually I started getting interested in the um, Victorian era stuff as well, sort of pre World War One, and I really dismissed the Cold War era stuff, thinking, you know, not really relevant, can't be that collectible. But I've got to say, they've really, really grown on me over the last couple of years. And um, when I go looking for new bayonets like I am at the moment, it's really what I go looking for now. I've lost a lot of interest in uh, a lot of the older stuff because let's be honest, I don't want to maintain it. I don't want to clean it. I don't want to store it co uh, correctly. I just want to be lazy and chuck it in a box and store it away for later when I'm going to do a video or use it as a prop in a video about a similar bayonet. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really into Cold War era bayonets at the moment and um, I don't know what I'm going to be hunting next, but um, I'm definitely on the lookout for something. So I'm trying to broaden my horizons a little bit. Anyway, guys, sorry if it's been a bit of a rambly video. As I said, I'm a bit under the weather. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, um, please give us a like. It helps with the algorithm. Uh, the channel's been growing nicely, and I've really enjoyed all the support. But uh, thanks for watching.